I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and I'm a lawyer. So I already got two strikes against me, but lawyers are self-confident. We're OK. And if you're from New York City, you're OK also. Uh, I am a labor lawyer. I've been practicing four decades. It's a long time. I've been an arbitra I started out as a trial lawyer with the NLRB, National Labor Relations Board. And I've been a full-time labor and employment arbitrator for the last 35 years. Notwithstanding my success, I have been kicked off of panels with America, with no, with Aloha Airlines. I've been kicked off of panels with Hawaiian Airlines. I've been kicked off panels with the U.S. Postal Service. I've been fired more times than you guys. Okay, that's the nature of the job. You can't keep everybody happy. You're going to make decisions that people don't like. There's no rights and wrong in, the, in this uh, process. So don't let your ego get in front of you. I'm still learning things 40 years later. Don't feel uptight about the process. You know, just like the other day, you know, the guys who are sports and gals who are sports fans, it's amazing how you can watch things now after 30 or 40 years and still see things that are, you've never seen before. The other day on the football highlights, they showed a guy catching a ball. The defensive back was right in his face. They were falling down. I don't know if you saw it. And the receiver had the ball around the guy's back as he's tackling him. And he fell to the ground with the ball on his back. And it was a catch, OK? I'd never seen that in, in all the years I've been playing ball. Then you see a baseball player where the ball hit him off the head, and then he's juggling it around catching it. So the point is, you're always going to learn some things and not to be intimidated by this process. Uh, oh, and for those of you who don't believe in free speech, this is not the class for you. I use, this is an adult class. I use adult language. If you don't like adult language, then either put up with it or withdraw from the class. I use adult language as a means for teaching because most people find it funny. I don't go to the improv clubs and listen to the dirty comedians, but I, I am a little bit raunchy sometimes when I'm teaching because I want to make a point. And I make my points in four-letter words sometimes rather than in 12-letter words. So if any of you are offended, I apologize in advance. It won't be all the time, but that's the way I teach, OK? Um, if you have questions as we go throughout the day, ask them. This class is designed for you to ask questions. Do not feel embarrassed that it may be a stupid question. OK? That's really important. Because, like I said, there are things that I'm learning. Our counsel here on the side are learning all the time. If you, this is a place to ask whatever questions you want to get clarification. All right, now before we start and we move ahead, I want, as Kathleen was talking about, the beauty of LA Trade Tech is that you learn as union reps, and hopefully we have some management people, because this class is designed to be even-handed, labor and management. But 90% of the people or more are from the unions. OK? As I said, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce our two speakers. Uh, the way we're going to do it is labor and management. I'm, since uh, management is always prepared and unions shoot from the hip sometimes, uh, I put the burden on the union lawyers to make the presentations. And then our management lawyers or management representatives will do the color commentating. So again, a lot of this stuff, most of this stuff is very generic and applies to both labor and management, as you're going to see. And the people who are here from the management are especially smart because they're learning what it, how the union thinks and what goes on. And you guys are going to learn that so much of the information on the union side is the same thing management does. Um, so. We're going to have uh, Adam Stern is here and Tom Lenz. Adam is a union lawyer, private practice. He's been practicing law for about, what, 22 years, Adam? 
I think I'm up to 23 now. 23, so that's pretty close. So, so I am accurate because I said about 22 years. If I said he is 23 years, or if I said if he was 22 years, I'd be wrong. Words are very important. I'm going to repeat these things many times. Words, you have to listen to what people say. So Adam's been around the block for 23 years as a union lawyer. Tom Lenz has a similar background to some extent that I have. Tom is a management lawyer. Before he went to work for his company, uh, for the firm Atkinson Anderson, Lawyer, Rude, and Romo, Tom spent several years with the National Labor Relations Board and then left the NLRB and went to work on the management <coughs> side. And I worked at the NLRB also before I became a, uh, an arbitrator. And I also worked with Atkins and, and Andelson when they were at the NLRB with me and they created this huge monster law firm. So we're going to start off with Adam and then the other, other lawyers and people, they're not all lawyers, that uh, we'll be talking as we uh, do our class. Okay, so Adam, you're going to start off and you're going to cover uh, duty of fair representation, how to file a grievance. Um, what else are you doing? Uh, I haven't decided yet. Where's my paper? Did I give it to you? Hmm. Oh, no, I got it right there. Adam is going to talk about, if you come up here closer, Adam, it's easier for them to finish. Adam's going to talk about the role of a, of a union steward, duty of fair representation, definition of a grievance, how to file a grievance, common mistakes, and best techniques uh, that he sees as a lawyer. <coughs> I brought my little stool. I don't know how, when I first came here, usually blackboards or whiteboards are supposed to be low enough to write on. And, uh, and this one, you have to be six foot five in order to be able to reach to the top. So uh, I will be taking some notes. Uh, Tom will be uh, jumping in with Adam, and I ask you guys both to stay in this area, talk a little slower than I normally talk. I'm not going to jump in on you. Yeah, I'm not going to jump in on you. Really? And I'm going to. Well, I will to That'll some degree. That'll be a first. I will. Right, but not as much as normal. So I'm pull over there, and I'll get a be pool going. I say inside of three minutes he'll jump in. Okay, no muttering, Adam. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, let's see. You. Been introduced to me. My name is Adam Stern. I've been practicing labor law about 23 years. I do both uh, public sector and private sector, and most of the things I'm going to talk about apply equally to both. So you don't have to worry if I give a private sector example. It probably applies equally as well with the public sector. Um, when we figure, how many people work in the public sector? Just raise like your hand. The crowd, yeah. And how many people work in the private sector? Perfect. So it's about 50/50. Okay. Okay, the role of the steward, that is almost an impossible topic for me because every union is set up a little bit differently. You all have different contract language. You all have different past practices. In some shops, stewards have lots of power to sink the union, to win grievances, and do all kinds of good things. In other unions, stewards are the eyes and the ears of the local union on the job site, but don't really have a whole lot of power to bind the union but you're in a position where you could potentially get the union in trouble. You're in a position where you could potentially lose rights for the folks that we're trying to represent. For example, it's generally unlawful for an employer to make any change to a term or condition of employment without first giving the union notice of the intended change and an opportunity to bargain about that change. Okay. So one issue in those cases is always, did the union get notice of the change? Well, you're a shop steward. It's Friday afternoon. It's 5 o'clock. You've hit the time clock. You're walking out to the parking lot, and the boss says, hey, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be great games this weekend. I'm going fishing, uh, this, that, the other thing, and we're going to change shifts Monday morning. And you go, oh, okay. Have a great weekend. Uh, go Dodgers, whatever. And uh, kind of forget about it over the weekend and the union doesn't find out about it. We have six months for, most un for all unfair labor practices in the private sector. For most public sector people, it's six months as well. Uh, the DWP folks, it's 90 days. Um, but for the most part, it's six months. If time goes by before the union finds out about it, we lose our right to challenge it. Now, whether or not that conversation in the parking lot constitutes legal notice to the union through the shop steward, I have no idea. 
because it, it depends upon the facts of the case. It depends upon, like I said, your collective bargaining agreement, uh, the past practice of the relationship, and what stewards have been allowed to do and what they have not been. Since I can't uh, evaluate each one of you in terms of your ability to sync your local in a legal way, it's just best to assume that everything you're told, every piece of paper you're given, is going to get to the union. So you need to give the, you need to pass on any type of verbal notice. Was that about three minutes? No, no. I Did just, I win the pool? I'm sorry, go ahead. Keep, keep going, I just want to make a comment when you're done. Okay. So it's tremendously important to just assume that you're in that legal position to bind the local to that notice. So tell the local about everything that you are informed about. And that way it won't be on your head if the thing blows up. So what you guys have to know when you're taking these classes, you're learning about generic, what generally unions do. It's important for you, critically important for you, to know what your, the philosophy is, the rights and responsibility of your particular local unions. Everybody understand that? So that's one of the nice things when you guys are talking together uh, at breaks and, in, and at lunch, you find out what differences are and we'll some of them out. But you need to know what's going on where you work and in your union. Okay. One of the primary roles as a steward is to catch grievances from the folks that you represent. You're at work minding your own business and Joe comes up says, I want to file a grievance. The cow jumped over the moon last night. I think that violates Article 4 and the company owes me a million dollars. And you go, that's a bunch of bullshit. There's no cow jumping over the moon in our contract. Get the hell out of here. You're always full of crap. And then later on, he changes his story. He said, I didn't want to file a grievance about the cow jumping over the moon. I got fired last night, and I wanted to file a grievance on that. Now, so far, we just have a verbal conversation. I want to file a grievance. The cow jumped over the moon. You're full of crap. You're always full of crap. I'm not taking your grievance. We have nothing in writing. This is a perfect setup for a duty of fair rep claim, which even if we win, we will cost the union tens of thousands of dollars defending. When a member comes to you and says, I want to file a grievance, you should give them a grievance form. I don't care how ridiculous their complaint is. I don't care if literally they're complaining about the cow jumping over the moon. Give them a grievance form, say, the cow jumped over the moon and what you want me to do about it. Now you've got a written piece of evidence in the grievance own handwriting saying the cow jumped over the moon. So seven months from now when he files his lawsuit against you, me, the local, everybody and their cousin, we have slam dunk proof that he never came and complained about a discharge. He was complaining about the cow jumping over the moon. But if you don't give him that grievance form and let them fill it out in their own hand, it's your word against Joe's word. That's called the dispute of fact. Dispute of facts go to trial. We don't want to go to trial on a duty of fair rep claim. We want to file a motion and get out of, uh, get out of dodge as quickly and cheaply as we can for the union. You had a question? Uh, the word you just used, dispute, was it dispute of fact? A dispute of fact. Um, that means a lot to lawyers. Lawyers think the world's divided into questions of fact and questions of law. Uh, the question of law is how long do I have to file a duty of fair rep claim? A question of fact is, what did the grievant tell the steward the day the uh, grievant came in to file the grievance? Judges will handle questions of law. They will decide that. that. That never goes to a jury. Disputes of fact, what did Joe tell the shop steward that day? And there's, there's no conclusive evidence on it. He's saying one oh, thing, wait, Joe's saying still. another. <laughs> that goes to a jury. Jury trials are long and very expensive. And that's why I'm saying we can all win this hypothetical duty of fair up claim that we're cooking up right now for our local and still bankrupt the local. It could easily cost $100,000 to defend a duty of fair rep claim before they go to the Court of Appeals. So we want to avoid these things, and the best way to avoid them is to establish good habits. And the first good habit I want you to establish is always take the grievance. Always let the grievant write it out. I don't care how wacky it is. I don't care if the grievant has filed 12,000 frivolous grievances about the cow jumping over the moon. The grievance, you know, it's a one-page form. It's not that much money, and it might save you $100,000 or more. Okay. 
we have a lot of questions about is this a grievance or is this something else? Is it a complaint? Are we whining? What is it? And this is where, as stewards, you have to know your contract. But knowing your contract's not enough. As Lou said this morning, he's learning stuff all the time. I'm learning stuff all the time. I learn stuff from shop stewards. I learn things from judges, from reading cases, from everybody I bump into in the world. So <clears throat> you may know your contract cold. You have, may have memorized all 100 pages of that bad boy. You know every word in the contract. And somebody wants to file agreements, and you know it's not covered in the written words of the contract. So do we send them packing? Yeah. No. We take the grievance. Let the grievance write out the grievance. There's all kinds of grievances that have been successful even though there was literally not one word in the contract that addressed the topic of the grievance. There's things, and I'm not going to get into this in a detail because other speakers will, but there's things like past practices. There can be a past practice that is very solid, happened for 20 years, never varied from, and then all of a sudden the employer changes that. That might be grievable, even though there's not one written word in the contract that you can point to. And then you get into all kinds of layers of subtlety from that. You can uh, build arguments based upon certain language that when you read it, you think it's got nothing to do with anything. Uh, subcontracting of bargaining unit work, and the, and the contract does not use the word subcontract. It's not addressed. What do we do with that? Well, in some cases, and don't get too excited about this because they're probably the minority, arbitrators have relied on the recognition language. The company hereby recognizes Local 1 as the exclusive bargaining representative of X, Y, and Z employees. They've also uh, relied on the wage rates provisions and all kinds of provisions. In fact, in, in the right subcontracting case, I can take the position that not only has the recognition clause been violated, not only have the wage rates been violated, but literally every word of the contract because it has not been applied to this group that's now doing the work. So just because you have to know your contract, you have to know it cold, but just because something's not in the contract does not mean it's not grievable. Okay, let me interrupt for a second. Just getting let me also give another generic statement. These classes that are on Saturdays and Sundays or Saturdays are basic, basic classes. We skim most of the issues. If you want to get really into it and you have the time and the, you have the energy, you take the classes that are the, on, on Tuesday nights or Wednesday nights for like 14 or 16 weeks. That's where you learn the deep stuff. What we're teaching you here is the basics. The basic idea, and we'll deal with it a little bit more later on, is FFG. I came up with this uh, FFG about a year ago. It took me all this time. You file the grievance. The F is the four-letter word. You file the fucking grievance because if you don't, you could be sued. Now, Tom, let me ask you on the management side. Adam was saying you file grievances over anything, even if it's not in the contract, to protect the union. What, ha what do supervisors and companies feel when the grievances just keep coming from some union rep that you know they just don't understand why they keep filing these grievances. What do you advise your clients? Well, they come to me and they ask, why the hell is this happening? Why am I being barraged with these complaints, these frivolous things that are wasting my time? Uh, is my mic on? Okay. Mine is not. Okay. They want to know why they continue to face this harassment, and. We have to explain to them that you have a collective bargaining agreement. You have an employee who has rights to file grievances under a collective bargaining agreement. And we have to acknowledge that they have different issues that they will raise. You may not like them, but there's a process to deal with them. And in, in talking to management about this, we need to explain to them that you get these grievances, you investigate whether there are any facts supportive of the grievance or something that you can use in defense, and you use that to respond. And hopefully you can make the issue go away. I think that if it's something that is potentially 
uh, going to have um, merit or something that you're not sure about, try to get as much information as you can. Uh, you want to you know, discover the information available uh, to the extent the union will provide it to you. You uh, want to investigate past practice because maybe there's an issue that may not be apparent on the face of the agreement, but the past practice between the company and the union may give rise to something more than what you see on its face. There are some types of information that, and it's usually when the union's requesting information of management that this issue comes up, uh, more often than management requesting it of the union. There are some types of information that management is automatically required to turn over, like names of employees in the bargaining unit, job classifications, dates of hire, rates of pay, stuff like that. If you guys don't know that and you're acting as stewards, acting as union representatives, I think uh, you, know, you need to step up and ask for that information and do so on a regular basis. Uh, there are other types of information that uh, you know, maybe uh, you, know, you want employees' social security numbers, maybe you want somebody's personnel file, maybe you want uh, you know, something beyond what I first mentioned. And I think when it comes to issues like that, you probably are going to need more of a justification. Uh, I think management has a harder time, a more uphill battle requesting information of the union, but to the extent somebody's raising an issue of violating the agreement, I'm going to push as hard as I can for management to get that information because I want to know what you have against me and why you think it violates the agreement. I have a whole different take on it because I come from the other side of the aisle. When manager gets mad because they think we have a frivolous grievance, and I don't really see frivolous grievances going very far in the process. I've already told you, take the grievance and file, you know, FFG, file the frickin' grievance, right? But how far you have to take that is a whole other question. And when management gets all upset and goes, well, this is a frivolous grievance, first of all, I hear that every freaking day, so it doesn't really mean a whole lot to me. And secondly, I'll ask management, hey, would you rather have a grievance that might cost you a million bucks in your job or some bullshit you can get rid of in five minutes? Personally, if I was in HR, I'd take the five-minute job. Yeah? <laughs> Absolutely. So I don't know why they always get so upset. I'd, I'd be much more concerned about a grievance that might cost my company a million bucks with my name on it somewhere. I think Adam raises a really valid point, and I think when you do have a collective bargaining agreement and a bargaining relationship, the longer that relationship has been in place, often the more mature uh, will, will be the way in which the parties deal with each other, it'll be smoother, and you'll be able to really cut to the, the chase on the issues so that you can get things disposed of that deserve to be disposed of. When people get worked up, uh, it's often in a new bargaining relationship or a supervisor who hasn't been adequately trained. Okay, you heard what Tom said. I'm going to ask them about the relationship, because Adam hinted at it. You liken yourself sometimes to a warrior, right? You like to go to battle, right? <laughs> right? See, this is what's Hate important. As an arbitrator, as a parent with your children, you're looking for reactions, right? You're looking for reactions. You're listening to the words. So you can see he likes to go to battle. But then on the other hand, you said you're trying to get the cases resolved, right? Absolutely. I mean, I don't want to settle the case because I love fighting the case. I mean, that's just what I do. I love getting in a trial. I love mixing it up. I love the whole thing. But I don't ever put my ego in front of my client. You know, Lou was starting this out with he doesn't have any ego. I got plenty of ego for the whole room, no problem. But I've seen lawyers put their ego in front of their client. And I've seen it cost their client the case. And I will never put my ego in front of the client. I don't make the decision on a settlement. I'm not daddy. I'm not the big boss. I work for you if you're, if you're the union. You're my boss. You guys make the decisions. I give the best advice I can. I tell you what's behind door number one, door number two, in my opinion. But you guys make the decision. If I think somebody is making a bad decision on whether or not to settle, then um, I will explore that decision with them. I'll say, look, this is what's going to happen if you go to trial. This is what the company lawyer is going to ask you. This is what cross-examination is going to look like. He's going to ask you this. You got an answer for that? No? Well, then maybe we ought to go back and look at that settlement. OK, but you're the lawyer. What you're saying equally applies to union stewards, right? Mm -hmm. Don't let your, your ego get in the way of settling it when you're a steward, right? 
Well, that, you, you can't let your ego get in the way at all. And your ego is going to want to get in the way the first second the fight starts because it's your boss telling you you're wrong. But now you're not the employee. You're the shop steward. Oh, okay, so now right? So now you're going to want to stand up and give it back because you're representing all these folks and they want you to go in there and pound the table and prove that you got some guts and some balls and you're going to take care of this problem, <laughs> right? I love people like that. Come in and yell at me. Pound the table. I love yellers because they're going to yell at me everything they know and they think. And I'm going to, you know, it's like a poker game, right? And you have to decide what information you're going to reveal and when. And screamers and yellers and people with huge egos, they can't shut up and they let it all out. And that's fantastic. Uh, and you know, probably one of the greatest skills that a steward or a human being in any endeavor needs is the ability to listen. My father used to, I used to argue with my old man all the time. I never won one. And he used to always tell me, the whole art of arguing is understanding your opponent. Understand your opponent's position or you're never going to get off of square one. When I was a kid, I always thought that was just a convenient way to make me shut up. You know, now it turns out the old man wasn't so stupid. So, you know, never be afraid to shut up and listen. I and mean, the hardest part in the union business is knowing when to stop talking. But what is the purpose? Again, you guys are very rarely going to see your lawyers. So you got to remember what, what they're talking about applies to union reps and management reps. What is the basic purpose of the union rep when the grievance procedure? To get a settlement, right? Mm -hmm. or to repre Resolve One is to problem. represent the employee, represent the employee, and to get a settlement. And a settlement may mean a withdrawal of the grievance, sure. correct? If the, right? if the grievance has no merit, you're not supposed to die on your sword, right? Right. There's, I mean, well, okay. there might be occasions where you've got to die on your I, sword. I, I don't want But I think it. those are rare, right? Okay. So now, Tom, it's the same thing. You mentioned the relationship. So, so let me, before Tom, because he's already answered that, is it good to have a good relationship with management? I think... You know, in any endeavor, you always do better if the people on the other side trust you and respect you. Whether or not they like you, you know, if you can get liked, that's even a, a better, that's a bonus. But I am very careful in what I say when I deal with management, HR, or management lawyer, or whatever else. I want to make sure that everything that I tell them is good as gold. So that when, because in this business, you bump into the same people all the time, right? And if you lie to somebody, you know, if I try to bullshit him on a case and tell him I got a piece of evidence that I don't have, or a witness is going to say something the witness is never going to say, I might be able to bullshit him once. I kind of doubt it. Maybe I get away with it, right? But the second time, I'm going to get paid back like you wouldn't believe, and he is never going to trust me. So if I have a case where I've got something legitimate and we really need to settle this thing and somebody's getting hurt and we need to fix the problem, and I go up to him and I go, hey, buddy, and he's like, screw you, I don't care what you're going to say. You screwed me last time. I'm not giving you anything this time. It's, it, and I'll give you an example. I mean, every once in a while, we got to kind of finesse something. You know, maybe we don't have super solid grounds, but we still have an argument. I, I had a, a state employee got disciplined, and, and the excuse was the boss told her to do it. And at trial, I had, it was Caltrans. I had these five big, burly Caltrans guys. It was great. Every one of them bigger than me. Very impressive. And the state attorney walked up to me and said, well, who are all those guys? Because I never have witnesses. I don't know why. Um, I said, they're my witnesses. i got witnesses today. And he, and he says, well, what's this all about? And I said, well, the boss told the employee to do whatever she did. And he looked at me. And I've been dealing with this guy for 15 years, and I never BS'd him, right? And he looks at my five guys, and he goes, all five of those guys heard the boss tell this woman to do it? I go, well, not exactly. Each one of them heard a piece. And I'm going to have to put it together, but I got no problem. I'm sure I can do that. I had lots of problems, and I wasn't sure that I could do it, right? But it was a very important case, and uh, I've been dealing with this guy forever. I've always backed up everything I've ever told him. And when I told him I could put it together, no problem, he believed me. We settled the case, back to work, and everybody was happy. That's the exception, you know? That's like the one time in 20 years of dealing with this guy. And I didn't lie to him. Um, but I don't know if I could have put the pieces together the way I said. Um, uh, so when things get really wiggly, you know, it's that one in a thousand time. The other 999 times, you don't want to finesse it. 
You don't want to fluff it, right? Uh, because you want the other side to believe you. We cannot arbitrate every case. If your union takes every grievance to arbitration because the relationship is so nasty, we just want to fight, you're going to have to quadruple your dues every month to pay for it. Because these guys aren't cheap and you know, neither are the attorneys, right? And the court reporters. The what percentage of the grievances from your unions go to arbitration? Let's get that out there right away. What percent? Oh, probably 5% maybe. Okay, that, okay. you understand that? So when, when Adam's talking, remember, at five percent of grievances go to arbitration, which means what? You guys are settling ninety-five percent. You guys, Tom, comment on the relationship again between management and union from the perspective of management people that you represent and how you tell them. Because I'm sure you get a lot of some management just hates the union, right? Some management. Uh, and how do you deal with that? Some management dislikes the union, and. It really depends upon how the relationship has gone. Um, I have a number of clients where you know, management and the union get along very well, and one of the greatest concerns they have, because they've developed a strong relationship and they've worked well with certain representatives or stewards, is when there's change. Uh, I have had some clients who have been party to collective bargaining agreements and relationships for a long time, and uh, it causes great panic when there is reassignment of representatives, of stewards, because suddenly there are questions as to what was past practice. Is there a past practice? You know, what, what is allowed and what is not allowed in this relationship? I think that the greatest thing in labor relations when you are in a collective bargaining relationship is to be able to sit down and speak honestly about what's going on, whether you are a union representative, a steward, or a union staff, or if you are a management representative charged with that interaction with the union. Um, if you can be considered by the other side a straight shooter, that means you're going to say what's happening, what's on your mind, and you're not jacking somebody around. I think that's the greatest compliment you can be paid in this field. People may not agree with you, but they will at least understand where you're coming from and be better able to deal with you. If you're hiding the ball or lying, you're not getting anywhere and it's going to go downhill. If you are a straight shooter, you're going to get a lot more stuff resolved instead of reinventing the wheel and I think uh, creating a motion that really on the management side is going to frustrate and complicate even the most simple issues later on. I'm going to repeat certain concepts throughout the day. Now you heard them both say one thing was the same. Understand your opponent, understand the other side. A lot of people on both sides only look in one direction, their side. If you do that, you will not be successful in whatever role you're playing. You must know what the other side is saying. You must not only know it, as, as Adam and both of them both use that same word, understand. That's more than knowing. That's understanding what the problem is. Once you understand the problem, then you work to figure out how to solve it. Okay? Now, later on in the afternoon and tomorrow, mm -hmm. I'm going to pound the shit out of the definitions a little bit more of what the duty of fair representation actually is because I want the lawyers to give sort of their perspectives from their standpoint. All right, now let me, oh, I just. Could I add a couple comments? Yes, please? go ahead. Um, taking it a step further with what I had to say, the, I, I think when a lot of collective bargaining relationships are new and the, the management and the employer are starting to deal with each other, getting to know each other, it can be somewhat adversarial. And I think it should be each side's goal to get past that adversarial relationship. If you can look at it as a partnership and a, an opportunity to work with each other for mutual benefit, I like to tell my unionized employer clients, you can stay out of court if you've got a grievance process. You can actually add value to your company. It may cost you more on the wage and benefit side, you know, depending on what the package is in the agreement, but you're going to save money on people like me, which is not necessarily good for me, but it's something that you know, is going to keep them from being sued, from having juries award millions of dollars if there's some sort of suit. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll give it back to uh, Lou and Adam. Adam, here's what I want to ask you. From your experience, 
where you get cases from the union and they pass it on to you for arbitration, right? What are the common mistakes, problems, where you say to them, here, get me this more information, or here, you know, what's the problem? Yeah, yeah. What, what can you tell them from your practical experience on, on the, some of the tips of the trade uh, that you've seen that the unions screw up on and... Uh, you got it. And, and this ties in really well with understanding your opposition's position. It's very good for settling the case. Not all cases settle. But understanding your opposition's position is tremendously important for building up our case. From the moment the shop steward gets it and does whatever the shop steward does, gets kicked up to the business representative and then they do whatever they do, and then the whole pile mess hits my desk. I've had discharge cases where I read the entire file twice and I can't tell why the guy was fired. This is a failure to understand the opponent's position. Why did they fire this person? This case has been slated for arbitration, they've hired an attorney, they're spending all this money, and I open up the file and I can't tell what the hell the guy got fired for. And it's been through three grievance meetings, it's been through a shop steward and a business representative. If you can do nothing else as a shop steward, if you can nail down the facts, you've done a lot. So, if you're in that first grievance meeting, uh, say it's a discharge case, why? I mean, I got a case going on right now. The guy was supposedly caught sleeping. They went and they looked at all his uh, logs and records and his time swipe and decided he was three minutes off on everything and fired him. I don't know if he got fired for sleeping on the job or for falsifying the time logs. And there's nothing in the file that tells me that. So at a minimum, if you can just nail down the facts of the case and record those facts, then you've done a lot. Tom, on the management side, what are the biggest impediments as to why management loses cases or doesn't settle that you see? Management loses cases or doesn't settle because of ego, <laughs> because they fight for principle, and they're not looking at it like business people, because nobody can agree on what the reason was why they fired somebody, <laughs> uh, because they didn't document their file, and they give it to me to arbitrate, and uh, they say that you know, somebody crashed the truck, and it's like, okay, where's your proof that the, this person was even driving this truck? Uh, it's, it's amazing sometimes, and you can lead the horse to water from the management side, but not make them drink, and you can talk about all these good practices, but management may not do that, and depending upon how well management trains, it's low to mid-level supervisors on gathering facts and following a decision-making process. It does not guarantee that that will be done. And when it comes time to try to settle a case or uh, to uh, take a case to arbitration, we may not have that. Or we may have people who tell completely different stories no matter how much you try to prepare them. So what's the common thread for both management and union? Failure to investigate, get all the facts, ego, Principle, you hear the same thing on this side. Again, it's the same, basically, for both sides. It's the egos, it's the failure to investigate, whichever side you're on. Okay, that's, so that's interesting to understand that. And later on, when we teach how to investigate, what are the principles of just cause, you're going to see that management and union do the same type of an analysis and an investigation. The union is entitled to information relative to, re relevant to the grievance, okay? So the union has to show, first of all, why they want it and explain it. That only makes sense because that's why you're asking in the first place. Management must give it. If management doesn't give it, number one, then you know, as a steward, you go to your business agent, your business representative, because that supervisor, they're not giving it to you. It's out of your hands. You go to your business rep. If they can't get it done, they go to their lawyers, and the lawyers fight it out. Okay? But if you want to make your record, you send a letter. First, you may ask a request. Hey, buddy, can you give it to me by next week? They don't answer you. You send a letter. Hey, I asked you, can you get it to me by next year? No answer. Then you send a certified letter, proof, okay? Now you've got your paper trail, all right? Then you get to your lawyers, and the lawyers say to you, 
shit, you're doing a good job. You understand what to do. When a person gets a certified letter, they usually know you mean business. But they're going to give it to their lawyers and stuff. So if you're having a problem, and I'll let you answer, if you're having a problem, you have to understand, if you can't get it resolved through yourself, through your business agent, it goes to lawyers. Yeah. Adam? Uh, well, this man asked two specific questions we haven't answered yet. How long do you give management to cough up the information? Depends upon what you're asking. You know, I, I, I got, I'm a lawyer. I got to say that depends. If you're asking <laughs> for one piece of paper, you're asking for one time part from one guy from one day, that should not take management a long time to get. I would not give them more than a week to give me that. Okay? And if they didn't give it to me within a week, I'd call them up and go, what the hell's going on? Are you guys hiding something? What's the problem? Did you lose the time card? What's going on? Why does it take this company a week to give me one piece of paper? Well, hold on. Now, you heard what Adam said. He calls him up and he says, what the hell is going on? You're on the other side. What do you hear? You hear sort of a combative person at that point, right? Remember, your words are important. Sometimes you have to fight. How many of you here have a bad relationship with the other side? Okay? How many? Okay, fine. So, wait, wait, wait. Hold it. How many of you, how, so we have about 10 or 15. How many of you have a good relationship with the other side? Depends on the employer. We have, okay, so again. Depends on the employer. You can't vote twice on the same. Hold on. What, if you're watching the hands, you will see that there is about a 50-50 break. Okay? So when we're talking and we're talking these things, we're talking about how you, if you can have a good relationship, it's better. If you don't, then you have to go to these other, you know, uh, options. Okay? okay, so we sing Kumbaya and we still don't get the, uh, right. you know, <laughs> the, the information you want. You file a charge. If you're public sector in California, you probably file to the California uh, Public Employee Relations Board. If you're private sector, it goes to the National Labor Relations Board. If you're a city DWP employee, it goes to the Los Angeles Employee Relations Board. But almost every labor relations statute now has an agency that will enforce it. How effective is that? Oh, that's, I've had, I, I've actually had the NORB issue a complaint in 24 hours from the time I filed a charge. In your third, 23 on, years. But only on, only on an information demand, because it's all in black and white. The government loves it. You got a written letter asking for this, and you got a written letter back from the company saying, pound sand, we're not going to give it to you. Or you got a second letter from the union saying, hey, I've been waiting for two weeks for this stuff. What's going on? Weird thing. Hold on. Yeah. We're just Can talking we generic. A little bit. The way you get your information, remember what I said. If management doesn't give it to you, what do you do? It doesn't matter whether you're private or public. You go to your business agents. If they can't get it, they go to the lawyers. <coughs> Forget the unfair labor practices. You want to play the unfair labor practice? How long can you d delay that? Oh, gosh. How long do you have? Okay. You understand? <laughs> We're talking about the real world. We're not talking about Adam. How many times have you gotten a, a, a complaint issued in 24 hours, in 23 Once. years? Once. Okay. I'm not here for bullshit. Once. I'm here for practical. <laughs> do, you have, do you want to have... If but you, that's the easiest complaint to get them to issue. Excuse me, though. Okay. If you call the other side, the other lawyer, mm -hmm. How often are you going to resolve those problems? Oh, 95%. You got it? I'm not interested in the 5% people. Okay, just so you understand. We're talking about real world. Okay, so we'll be nice. So forget the unfairs. Right. You call him, you get it done. We'll be you nice. Call we won't file anything. We won't huh? piss any we'll be nice. We won't piss anybody off. We'll sing Kumbaya and wait for the No, no. You're able to get it 95% of the time. Right. Because you call him. No, and no, they no. I get it 95% of the time because him knows if I don't get it, I'm going to go file a freaking charge. What's the bottom line? Amen, You're Amen. effective. You're, hold what? what? Amen, brother. Amen. Hold on. Hold on. Did you, what's the bottom, people, what's the bottom line? I don't care how he does it. He's the lawyer. He's the lawyer. They'll give it to them. Okay, because we have, uh, Lou, we got five minutes, left, four minutes left to cover. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to cover here. all that other stuff. I'd, I'd worry, like to I'm just uh, add a couple comments. Go ahead. Whether you're management or labor, make your information request in writing. Whether it's a letter, whether it's an email, whatever it is, build the paper trail. Nobody does it better, in my experience, than Louisa Gratz at Local 26. Uh, been through many situations with her on that. We, we had letters that laid it out. We discuss the information. What is it you're looking for? How can we just pin this down? And if you've got that paper trail, then, I mean, and showing an effort to work out what that information is, you're way better off. 
Also, try to focus in on what it is you really want. Don't just say you want all disciplinary records from the last year. Don't just say, I want information. Say, I would like uh, you to identify all employees who were terminated for crashing the truck in the last five years. Or I would like to know um, all uh, instances of um, discipline for uh, uh, drinking on the job. Uh, for the last uh, three years, or whatever it is you want. Make sure you identify the issue, identify the time period. Uh, if you can even identify people, that may make it better. And the more you pin the other side down, the more likely you are to get a quick response and a resolution. Writing a grievance. <laughs> Writing a grievance is like a miniskirt. And I know this is a horrible sexist analogies, analogy. If someone can come up with a better one, it probably won't change. <laughs> wait, wait, you're, you're moving too fast. Sorry. You write agreements like a miniskirt. How do you want a miniskirt? You want it to be short enough to be interesting, long enough to cover the topic. <laughs> and I'm not joking. No, 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 no. Don't laugh. This is important stuff. Every one of your contracts tells oh, you, man. every one of your contracts tells you what a grievance is. In order to, uh, to be a grievance, it must be signed by the grievance, it must identify an article of the contract has been violated, must whatever it is. I don't care what those hoops are. All we put down in a grievance form is what we have to to satisfy the contract's requirements for it to be a grievance. If the contract says it's got to be signed, it's got to be dated, and you've got to put down the article that was violated and what management did to violate it, that's all we are ever going to put on the grievance. Otherwise, we're violating the miniskirt rule. And we get in trouble when we violate the miniskirt rule. Okay, now we're going to violate the hell out of the miniskirt rule. I'm going to list 10 witnesses on my grievance. <laughs> Did you see that? Thank he you. He laughed. And then he said, thanks, Adam, sucker. Remember <laughs> poker player? Remember showing your cards at the right time? Why am I going to put 10 witnesses down there? Is management going to read this grievance and go, oh, my God, they've got witnesses. Get out the checkbook. It's not going to happen, right? They're going to go talk to every one of those 10 people, and they'll probably do it individually. And they'll probably get all 10 people to say 10 different things, right? Something like that so far? Uh, that, that sounds accurate. Yeah. So, and then what if we have unscrupulous management who's not above threatening employees or offering them, hey, you wanted, that, uh, you wanted to get off a night shift, right? Are you sure you remember what happened last Tuesday on that grievance? Right? You're putting those 10 people in harm's way in exchange for what good thing? Absolutely freaking nothing. You violated the miniskirt rule. Don't laugh. It's dangerous, right? Then what if you're going to put down uh, the company's wrong because they argue this and we have uh, the following 17 arguments to rebut them? Why? Does the contract say I've got to rebut their 17 arguments for it to be a good grievance? No. Then why am I going to give them a preview of my argument for free? Your employers give you stuff free all the time, right? Never. Not supposed to. You don't give them anything for free either. So you have to think about every word that you put on a grievance, and the question you ask yourself is, what am I going to get out of putting this word, this name, on this grievance? Am I going to comply with the contract so that the grievance can uh, proceed without me screwing it up forever and losing it? Or am I just doing something because I want to tweak management or I think this is a really good shot? Hold your shots for the time to shoot. Filing the grievance is not the time to shoot. Okay? Do not violate the miniskirt rule. Deadly serious. What management what, and what Adam said, which is the most important thing he said, and we're going to hit this many times, look at the definition of a grievance in your contract. Different unions are going to have different uh, definitions because it's negotiated. So you always, when in doubt about anything, the first thing you do is you look to the language in your collective bargaining agreement. Now we're going to continue on generally with these topic areas. We're going to talk about discipline. The, the, the most frequent type of a grievance is a grievance over discipline. And we're going to talk about the standards for disciplinary action, uh, what's called just cause, 
for imposition of discipline. We're going to talk about the Weingarten standards and the Weingarten rules. And we're going to talk about the standards of proof required. So when you're investigating, what type of proof is required. Uh, David Myers is also a union attorney, a little bit more youthful, less gray hair than some of us. Been a practicing, wow. huh? Practicing for 11 years. Uh, and he has no stomach, you see, he's in good shape. <laughs> I'm good. And any questions, if they don't hear it, repeat the question, I'll be there. I, I will do that, I will do that. I, I do want to point out a couple of things just because I was sitting here and, and talking about real world versus bullshit. Sometimes the real world is the bullshit. Right? Sometimes, sometimes we don't do stuff with the NLRB or PERB because we think we're going to win. We, 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 if we're not getting a response, we'll file with the NLRB or PERB because we'll we know we'll get a phone call. Right? And then after the phone call, we'll get the documents. So sometimes we'll throw stuff up, up against the wall, not because we know it's going to stick, but just because we know finally we'll get a phone call back. And, and then they say, well, what do you want? So, well, you know, the, the documents my union's been asking for for three weeks. Um, the other thing is sometimes, I think the question is, what happens when you don't get the documents? And if you're at arbitration, sometimes what happens is, let's say you ask for all the time records in the last year. Um, and and they, they say, no, go pound sand, go pound sand, go pound sand. And then you're in arbitration and, 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 and um, defense or, or management attorney. Um, start producing some of those documents. I think one of the first things we do is we say, no, we, hey, we've been asking for these documents for a year. They said it was too much. They shouldn't be able to use them now. I mean, now they can't just cherry pick the ones that they want to use. So at that point, we'll do one of two things. We ask them that they, they exclude that evidence, or we, or, um, and the arbitrator will, we'll, we'll ask the arbitrator to exclude it, and the arbitrator, depending on, on how he or she is feeling that day, will exclude it, or else the arbitrator um, we'll say, well, why don't we take a break? Why don't they produce all those records? And magically, we'll get them at that point. Um, I think the question is, what happens when you don't get the documents? If you're in arbitration, you say, no, we think those should be excluded. We've been asking for those for a year, and they never, they never produced them. All right? Um, but, but that's just that. A couple thoughts when, when, when Adam and, was sitting and, here. In your real world, and, and that was important about getting the attention. Just like the certified letter gets people attention, they know, most <clears> people understand. If they get a certified letter, people mean business on the other side. Like you just said, in the real world, you, you throw an unfair labor practice charge at somebody, it's going to get certain people's attention real quick. Because all of a sudden now they're dealing with the government, they're going to call Tom immediately on the management side to take it. So that, that's, that's a good real world example. We, we don't, listen, what do you do with an unfair labor charge if you win? You get a big blue poster. Who cares? Okay, that, remember what we just said also? When Adam was talking about that. And what, it, what was Tom's reaction? Remember? Here, move over. What was Tom's reaction? How much time do you want me to tell you, Lou? Because if you fight the unfair labor practice, if you are in a war with the other side, you can delay, delay, delay. And like David was saying, so what do we get if we win? So you got to remember, those are again the practical situations. If you want to fight, ladies and gentlemen, and you correct me on that, because it's when we say. You're touching my belly. I, see, I yeah. got a belly. You do? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. It has gotten smaller. My wife went on a diet, so I'm on a diet. It'll get bigger, though, yeah, well. as you get older. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> okay. If you want to fight, now you listen, right? Management's got most of the bullets in the gun, right? Unless you can walk oh, out on a okay. strike, right? All right. So you don't want to fight. That's another reason you don't want to fight. You want to be able to achieve your re resolution of the grievance as much as you can. And when you have to fight, you fight. Uh, when we were asked about if you file the unfair labor practice to get your information, all right? Now, I haven't done this in 35 years at the board, but apparently it still is. You have to go to the board, they have to make an investigation. After they make the investigation, they may find that you don't have a case, or they may find that you do have a case. So what do they do? They tell the company. If the company wants to fight and, and you know, get their gun out, we're not giving it. Okay, what are you going to do about it? Well, the NLRB is, we're going to file a complaint. Woohoo! Right? Yes. Woo -hoo. So what? File your complaint. Okay, then what? You'll have to set it for trial. Woohoo! 
Well, how long? I don't know what the, how, they've shortened it, but how long till you get to a trial? Uh, well, it could be anywhere three to six months. Okay, three to six months. Woohoo! Hey, buddy, enjoy yourself. Your grievance is sitting out there. Six months later, they'll have a trial. Woohoo! And when do they get a decision? <laughs> Maybe about three months after that, if you're lucky. So about a year. <laughs> Who's got the bullets? Mm -hmm. Right? I got you. Got it? Okay. But even then, it's not enforceable until it goes to the board in D.C., so that might be at least another six months. Okay, everybody understand? Th th this is the... And, then, is not on your and side. then, if you don't like what the board does, you can take it to the courts, and that could tie it up at least another two, three years. Okay. So, so, so let's say... Wait, wait, let me just... Oh, uh, come you, on! Yeah, I'm going to give you... I've got to listen to Tom and his management. Well, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> let me at him, Lou. I will in a second. I will in a second. This is the 25% that, you know, that you, that you have to know other than just common sense the real world experience. Okay, so what's your answer? So, so sometimes, half my practice is traditional labor, half of it's civil litigation, right? So let's say we're in a grievance over oh. overtime. And we're no. dealing with, forget civil litigation. Oh, I can't forget well, it, Lou. We, I, I understand it? that. Do yeah, you use it? Yes, let me, okay, give ahead. me 30 seconds here, go right? Ahead. So management in their, in their, in their tone says, we're going, well, we're going to go through the, uh, arbitration, and we're going to go through the board, we're going to go all, all over this, and it's a wage and hour issue, right? Well, we don't think you guys are processing the grievance right under, under, under the grievance with regards to overtime, right? And, and they say, well, we're, we're going we're gonna to delay it, we're going to delay it, we're going to delay it, right? We say, all right, let me see if I can't refer this out to a civil attorney because I've got rights under the collective bargaining agreement, but I've also got rights under, the, under California law, right? And, and we'll go to court. And, and at that point, I think one of the things you start fighting back as to they might have the gun, Right? But we do have other stuff in our arsenal that you always sort of have to think, are there rights outside of the collective bargaining agreement that we can start putting pressure on them? And I think a lot of times where it happens is where the delay is in organizing and those kinds of issues. I think that's where they can really delay it. And that's typically where you'll see unions trying to get pressure to organize outside of the board because the board um, um, is somewhat... Um, it, it, it's, 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 it's not a perfect venue for the employees. Um, so so you, start, you start to look outside of the union context, and, and, and that's where we'll start to look at it. And what's your, okay, and what's your response to that? I would say that you know, there's certainly um, a management desire to delay uh, when, when management wants to fight an organizing campaign. That is certainly the trend. Um, I, I think that the, I don't want to stay on organizing campaigns. But, I, I understand, real. but but uh, in regard to what he uh, referred to uh, a moment ago, I, I think when you're operating under a labor agreement, management usually wants to get the issue resolved. But some things are very sensitive. Say somebody was terminated for harassment, and the union requests all information on employees terminated for harassment in the past, and management says, "Hey, look, that's confidential information. I can't disclose that to you." Uh, without compromising somebody's rights to privacy, without violating some harassment law. Um, that's maybe a more sensitive issue. That might take longer to resolve. So management might feel, I am going to violate some other rule if I try to comply with their rules, requests, what have you. So I mean, every request is different. Every response is different. Every relationship is different. But I, I think when you're operating under an agreement, management is going to be, I think, more inclined to try to just get the issue resolved. And, and I, I think one of the issues is you start, there, there's, there's sort of that natural put, push back and forth. I think, I think uh, Tom and, and, and the attorneys that work with him um, um, are intelligent attorneys, right? But the last thing you want is an attorney that's not very smart on the other end, because one, they don't sort of appreciate risk and they don't understand the arguments. Tom could sort of give me that argument, then I could push back on an argument to say, yeah, but once you harass somebody, you've given up a certain expectation of privacy. So, so within a couple of phone calls between two, the two of us, we, we come to an agreement and say, well, how about if we redact out stuff and blah, 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 blah. And you, get, you, you end up getting sort of modified what you want um, and the employer s is, feels comfortable that they're not going to get hit for some kind of other, uh, uh, some other kind of law. But I think what happens, you have to have knowledge. Um, exactly you want to talk right. about burdens of proof, or what do yeah, you want to talk about? Yeah, so, so I want to talk and make sure we're, these people are either union stewards or management reps. So I want to stay away from as much as possible the lawyers because they're not doing the lawyer work. Right. Okay, but what's also important is what David said, and he wasn't in the room when Adam was here, about this information and how they're able to resolve it. Again, if there's a problem, here we got another example from the union, you call him, they're able to resolve those thorny problems because they know the law and where their clients 
do not know the law will be fighting for a principle and all these other reasons. Okay, so now let's get into the typical grievance that goes to arbitration, and that would be a discipline case. So explain to them what the rules are, how uh, arbitrators or unions evaluate, what are the, uh, the tests of just cause, and, and how they would determine that. Um, so anytime that you've got um, um, a, a termination case, um, um, the, the burden is on the employer to satisfy that they have just cause under the union contract to terminate the employee. So, so um, the, the, um, it's going to be the, the employer's responsibility to identify um, that they've got the just cause. Um, the, the first issue that you're going to probably look at um, is, is there's sort of the old adage of, of, of uh, uh, the eight, um, um, eight reasons, eight tests. eight tests for just cause. Um, um, that you can go through, and they pr actually should be in your reading materials, and we can we can sort of go through all, through all of them. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> a test of just cause. Uh, uh, Lou is always sub. Well, all right. Go. Um, uh, first, first test is there a rule? Um, and, and let me sort of take a step back from the eight tests. I mean, the eight tests get sort of uh, uh, beaten to death. Um, you know, I think when you're a first year, second year attorney, you like them because you can sort of walk down and and, and do it. In general. It's, 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 I think that there's sort of a knee-jerk reaction when you hear the guy getting terminated. Um, 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 you know, does, does the employer sort of have enough on him? Um, and there's always, I think, a gut reaction, I think, on, on probably both sides as to how bad the grievance is or how bad, how, how easy it's going to be. I don't think you can necessarily walk down through all eight and then come out with what the arbitrator is going to do. Um, the first one is, is there a rule? Uh, is there a rule on what the employee is being uh, discharged for? Um, sometimes we have it like on internet usage. Well, the employee was, uh, we're terminating him for either excessive internet usage or improper internet usage. Um, whether that be um, um, going to um, sites that are non-work related, CNN, MSNBC, ESPN, or going um, on sort of one extreme or pornography on the other. Do they access pornography while at work? Um, um, and I think that you look at those kinds of issues. Now, the employer, like at my firm, we have no policy. You know, it's, 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 it takes too much time to actually sit down and write a policy to say, you know, don't go on the internet. Um, um, and, and there's sort of this reasonable expectation. Of course, I'm a non-union setting. Um, um, but um, uh, and then the, the next issue is, is there a policy? Does it, does it restrict um, anybody from going to the internet? Does it restrict people? from going to some internet sites but not others. Um, um, and then, and, and so you look to see if there's a rule. That's sort of the first step, all right? Um, did, did the grievance violate it? Um, if there's a rule, um, did, did, did the grievance violate it? That's usually where the, the focus of most arbitrations are. Okay, assuming that there's a rule, uh, did we violate it? Uh, and if there's no rule, that doesn't prevent the employer from disciplining them. Um, um, you know, there's a lot of times within management's rights to, to uh, keep a shop running and, 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 and you know, have a shop that, that um, uh, has sort of some rule and some order. So, so the fact that there's not a specific written rule is, is a factor. It's not dispositive because um, um, sometimes employees do things that the management never thought to write a rule on. Um, uh, but lo and behold, um, uh, they want to terminate them for it. Okay, so did the, did the grievance violate it? That's typically where the fight is. Um, was there notice of a rule? Sometimes a lot of our employees, uh, the, the employer will make a big stink of, hey, they violated this rule, they violated the rule, the rule is clear, and uh, management issued this rule six months ago. And then we, we address the issue of, uh, well, did you talk to, did you publish it? Does the union know about it? Do the employees know about it? Does this employee have specific knowledge? Because when it came out, he very well could have been, or she could have been out on maternity leave and didn't know the rules had changed. Um, so did the employee know about the rule and, and whether it was published? If it's a big enough rule, um, I think the issue becomes is could the employer change the rule um, on their own? Or, or is there an expectation that the um, um, is there an expectation that, that they would have to negotiate over the rule? 
And that becomes a, an issue as to whether or not there's an unfair because before you know it, the employer changed the rules on us and, we, and, and they had a duty to bargain over that and they didn't do that. What's your take? Can an employer change a rule? Generally, the general rule. Unless there's a restriction in the collective bargaining. No, I, I think that they probably can. Okay, and what's... I think they probably can. I mean, if it explicitly involves things like wages or work schedules, uh, I'm going to tell my client, yeah, you need to provide notice and talk about it first. Yeah, I think if it's, I think if it's wages, like, like this is how we're going to calculate overtime, or, or you used to get overtime at four, uh, anything over 40, even if the first eight hours was Labor Day, and now we're going to change that. I think that's a term and condition of employment, and, and you've got to negotiate that. Okay? If it's a policy with regard to, let's say, uh, um, uh, internet usage or something, something sort of less sort of meaty and sort of less knee-jerk reaction, um, uh, the employer will try and do that. Sometimes on the union side, you don't want to raise the issue because you don't want to uh, uh, waive the ability to claim ignorance. Right? Uh, sometimes, sometimes, listen, you know, the, the, the union will be like, either at the bargaining table at some point, do we want to raise this? No, because I, I always want to be able to argue in our back pocket, hey, we've never conceded on this issue. We never went to the bargaining table and tried to negotiate something on this topic. They say no, and then we, we write a contract that doesn't have that. So, so sometimes, if there's a rule out there, it's a little bit fuzzy. Sometimes, as a union rep, I want to keep it fuzzy, because I want to be able to argue it, hey, it's fuzzy. Generally speaking, if the rule has to do with <clears throat> conduct, conduct that we normally discipline people for, Unless the contract restricts it. Again, you always look to the contract. If you're the union and somebody gets disciplined or you're looking for a contract violation, you have the burden to find it in the contract. So if it has to do with employee misconduct, an employer is allowed to change rules so long as the rules are reasonable and related to the job. That's part of the employer's ability to run its business. However, and we'll get to this later, there's always exceptions. You know, the it depends. If the employer has allowed people to violate this particular rule, the employer then can't automatically enforce it against one particular person. That would be called unequal treatment. Whether you're black, white, woman, man, over 40, under 40, it's unequal treatment. It has nothing to do with any of those discriminatory reasons. It's just you're changing the rule. Uh, you're enforcing it against one. So if you're the employer and people have been getting away with certain violations of rules, then you have to give notice to everybody that we're now going to enforce this rule. And at that point, everybody has notice, okay? But generally speaking, employers are allowed to change rules as long as the change is reasonable and as long as it's not covered in the collective bargaining agreement, right? Exactly. Right. right? Okay, keep going. <clears throat> and I think, so what, what ends up happening is if we concede that they, concede that they have the right to implement the rule, <clears throat> on the union side, what we're looking for is, is okay, we concede that, concede that, and, and, but this is why it shouldn't be applied here. You can change the rules, but if you're going to change the rules, you better publish it, uh, and you better show that this employee had, had notice, or, or should have had notice. Um, um, sometimes, sometimes an employee will be like, well, I never went over to the, to the bulletin board, so I had no idea uh, we weren't supposed to steal. Um, uh, and, and, and the guy's been there for 20 years, right? And, 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 and you know, at some point, it's, it's, it's very sort of, you know, as the facts dictate, you can go with whatever your strongest argument is. Um, I think uh, to the issue of five and seven or somewhat, uh, well, five was the rule applied unreasonable. Um, again, I think these are all sort of gut issues for both management and, and um, uh, union side. Um, are, you, are you taking um, a rule that, that is reasonable, you know, internet usage, and, and saying, hey, we, we realize you went to three sites, um, we're going to terminate you on that. Uh, versus, you know, listen, you spent eight hours on the internet. Um, um, we're going to consider that theft of company time. 
Um, um, you know, uh, again, I don't think I think I think the 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 unreasonableness standard sort of speaks to itself. Six, was there a fair investigation? Um, the answer is always no. No. Uh, uh, was there a fair investigation? Um, it's 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 sometimes in, on our side. Um, you know, you remember that the management goes first, and we're left sort of fighting because you know sometimes our guys actually do the stuff that they're accused of, um, uh, and so then so what you're sort of left with is it, was there a fair investigation? And, and how did that investigation go? And where are the results of that investigation? Uh, sometimes we, I have employers in which once they do the investigation, they shred the investigator's notes. It's, it's standard protocol for them. Um, and I always think, and I always try to make the argument um, of, uh, that's, that's inherently not a fair, we're not left knowing whether it was a fair investigation because of the fact that the contemporaneous notes that the investigators took are nowhere to be seen. So if there was, there, there was different testimony, being given to the investigator, we never see that. Uh, Tom, I don't know if you ever have an opinion as to what to do during that investigation as to notes or anything like that. Mo most employers, I think, keep them. Most employers keep them, and uh, I, I think how they're used depends upon who created them. But uh, I, I always want to know about what facts have been gathered because it helps you not only understand the issues, but how you're going to present your case and um, if you're going to see inconsistencies there, uh, you're going to see weaknesses that uh, may make your case less desirable to fight and more desirable to settle. And so, yeah. Um, I, I guess I have, I have two questions around in the, um, the information collected during the investigation. So in does the union have a right to that information as part of the grievance process? So for example, HR took detailed notes about the confession or the questioning, line of questioning. Does the union have a right to that? And two, can the company decide and then investigate? Okay, well Tom, since you worked at the NLRB, you're gonna have a little bit of more knowledge somewhat than David. On that issue, on those two issues, and then you'll re re reply from your perspective. Um, I think, particularly with um, with information requests, you know, what what does management have? What is it investigated? I, I think management is going to have a duty to turn over a lot of that sort of information if the union representative thinks uh, to make that request. A lot of times they don't, and sometimes we're happy they don't uh, because you know we have things that we probably don't want you to see. But if you do make that request, um, unless there is some real confidentiality, privacy sort of sensitivity to it, or it's uh, something that's attorney work product in, the, in a company file that means uh, you know, something that I as company counsel put together or you know, something that the company shares with me specifically to discuss the case, a, a lot of that stuff you're going to be entitled to. Um, there, there has been some dispute over the years on witness statements. When, when management actually takes witness statements, whether those are uh, going to be made available, I think uh, the labor board these days is going to be more inclined to require disclosure of them than they might have been in the past. So uh, as a general tip, I would say uh, if you think there's something out there um, or if you know an investigation's been done, even if you don't know if an investigation's been done, ask. Uh, try to get as much as you can. And, and I think with information requests, information requests are a little bit different than, than or a lot different than the grievance, right? The grievance, as Adam says, uh, uh, short enough to, to cover the topic, but or whatever it is, long enough to make it interesting. The miniskirt <laughs> roll, we'll, we'll say that. Um, sometimes with, with information requests, what you want to do is any all on notes from human resources, uh, uh, Peggy Smith taken during the investigation. Um, any and all notes from any employee from management uh, regarding the investigation. You have the very broad, so when management, so let's say Peggy Smith doesn't have any notes, but, but, but John Smith does, and you're like, oof, thank God they didn't ask for John's, uh, uh, we can say Peggy doesn't have any. Um, um, but the, the, over, the overreaching one, any and all notes, would probably cover it. Um, as to your question of uh, can they terminate and then do the investigation, they can. Um, but I don't, think that, I don't think that that's a proper investigation. 
uh, because you've already reached the conclusion, now you're just doing an investigation to justify the conclusion. It's yeah, shooting and asking questions later, which <laughs> yeah, isn't advised. So, so as I, well, once one arbitrator said, bring the, bring the guilty SOB in so he can have his fair hearing. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, not, not you, Lou. Uh, uh, it was tongue in cheek. But uh, um, so, so with regards to, uh, uh, with regards to, to, the, to the timing, the investigation should definitely be beforehand. Um, as to what type of investigation is, sometimes I'm, I'm actually impressed as to what I want is the employer to do a thorough, thorough investigation. I want notes, I want witness statements, I want them to talk to everybody because inevitably um, um, I, I can always glean good stuff from it as opposed to an employer just, just doing it, you know, one guy uh, doing an investigation that lasts 20 minutes and they're gone. Um, um, sometimes, sometimes those, well, let me say, as opposed to a, a termination investigation where there's no notes or anything like that, um, th those are typically harder. And uh, you also want that from the union too, right? Um, a thorough it, investigation. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know, I, I, my concern, sometimes my concern is notes, right? Sometimes, sometimes I don't necessarily need but that's just me. The, the advice might be take good notes and blah, 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 blah. Like during negotiations, you might want to take good notes. But during a grievance procedure, sometimes it's tough because sometimes, listen, I want to be able to make the argument. You hire me to make an argument, um, um, and I don't want to necessarily be tied down to the facts that they were six months ago. Tom? Yeah, um, I would just uh, like to add on the information request side of things that management will sometimes say, hell no, when they get the grievance, and they've thought about it a little bit but not really dug in. It might be that information request that causes us to have a holy cow moment and say, that's right, that did happen, and you know, because you made that request and made us dig deeper into the details, or more specifically, I made my client dig into the details, uh, we're realizing things that perhaps weren't there on, on its face. So you might be forcing us to do some due diligence, which in the end is helpful to get the thing resolved. And I think it's really, really important that you do an information request on any termination. I mean, it's, 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 it's very problematic if you don't at least do that, because you never know what you're going to get. Unemployment hearings are, if not confidential, can't be used for other purposes. Um, um, so if they're going to produce unemployment transcripts, have your attorney or you start digging under the unemployment, because I, I used to love them, because the employer would go in there and make these crazy claims. And then, and then, sure enough, there's a provision under the unemployment code that says you can't use them for any purpose. And so they're considered confidential proceedings. You want me to get the section? See, it's interesting. No, 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 no. Oh. You can use the transcripts as to what they've testified to. I will, at break, I will find the labor code section. Yeah. Have you ever hit that? I, it's, a, it's a loaded question. No. I'll find it. Yeah. No. I, you can, if I'd you like to go, see that myself. If you, yeah, okay. If you go, <laughs> uh, Judy, bring it up. because I'm making Judy, an information request right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's go, In let's writing. keep going. Let's stay on, on this Get my thing, phone. On the rest of the, <laughs> the two more tests. All right. Two more tests. Right. Um, e, uh, fair investigation, uh, equal treatment of others. That's where you're, that's a lot of times where you're winning. That's where the, <laughs> the, the guilty SOB is coming back because of the fact that the, uh, uh, the guilty uh, supervisor also, also uh, surfs the internet um, uh, much more than our client does. Um, if you can show disparate treatment, if I can show that a management, another manager is doing it, another manager arrives five minutes late, or another manager is doing the exact same kind of conduct my guy is, um, then I'm smiling, okay? Um, now the question is, is when do you pop that? Sometimes if I, 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 I call, you know, somebody on the other side and I say, hey, management's doing it. Because I think I can get them to be like, what? And then they might turn it around. If I think, no, nah, this employer are, are hard-nosed and I can never get them turned around, then I hold off on that information. And then I hit them with them to arbitration. And, 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 but that's a tactical question as to when you're going to introduce that. You're a union steward. Yes. You're not at the lawyer level. Right. The union steward's job is to do what? To get resolve the re it. resolve it, right? So if you have good information that, and, and this goes to what you were just saying, if you have good information and you have a rel relatively trusting relationship with the other side, you're going to make it available, right? Right. Because you are going to expect that they're going to settle the case and resolve it, right? Right. But you're giving, and then you were just giving, as you said, the, the, the uh, 
not the normal, but when it is a adversarial relationship, that's when you hide it. Right. Because when you hide it, what happens, Lyle? And you go to arbitration. Kyle. Huh? Kyle. Kyle. What happens, Kyle? <laughs> if you hide it and you wait to the arbitration, how long will it be before you get to the arbitration? A while. No, no, no. Okay, you hear that? Us lawyers, when our wives tell us a while, excuse me, what the fuck is a while? A while to you could be three weeks, a while to somebody else could be two months, and a while to somebody else could be... Three at, years. As, as Tom said, how much time do you want? So when you are dealing with Anything you do, that's part of the problem of being a lawyer, you know, right? Exactly. Our spouses get pissed off at us because we want to know the specific words. A while could be how long, typically? In what? Uh, Normally. Six months. Normally, from a, from a grievance to a decision from an arbitrator. Oh, probably a year. Okay, got it? Yeah. So these are the practical things that you, when you come to the classes, you're learning beyond that 75%. What's the name of the game? And what happens a lot of times to your grievance during that year or two or three? What happens to many of them? They either go find, well, they either, it depends on how good the job is. I mean, they'll, they'll hang out for quite a while. But, but they, listen, they have they're problems. They're out of work. They're out of work. They can't pay their bills. Right. They're, they're, they've either won or lost unemployment. Right. And they have bank, either bankruptcy, mortgages, divorce, all kinds of stuff. It's another bullet I got for you. Ah, okay. Okay. Very good. Another bullet. Problem is, management doesn't know how to load a gun. That's that's <laughs> when. And, <laughs> and, and, and they, they need us to do it. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. If you're dealing with him, right. he knows how to load a gun. Okay. Now he's not going to load the gun very much because that's not his nature, and they want to get your matters resolved. But if you're going to deal with a guy from Brooklyn. Or if you're going to deal for a guy, when you're going to load your gun, you're going to load your gun too sometimes, right? Right. And that's what you want to avoid. You guys all know strikes are lo losses for both parties, right? So it's easy to laugh and everything else, but understand where you're coming from. Working together is always better, as long as you're not selling out, right? That's what you have to deal with as stewards. And his union reps. Hey, are you a sellout? How are you? You're not militant enough. Those of you who are experienced stewards understand that, right? How many of you are under uh, experienced students for more than five years? Okay, so if you disagree, raise your hands. So working together is important as long as you can. And as long as you understand your opponent and what their problem is, whether you're management or union, you try to resolve that problem. 95% of the problems will get resolved. Okay. I mean, they, they just inherently get it resolved at some level. Um, and, and, and a lot of times, when they don't get resolved, even when we're in front of a, an arbitrator, in the back of my mind, I'm still thinking we're here, but this issue is going to be resolved. And, it, and we sort of need to, to let that process go through. And Lou's been there where, where we say, okay, we're going to take a break. Uh, let's take a 15-minute break. And then you know, Lou probably looks at his watch at 15 minutes and looks at, at a half hour. And then at 45 minutes, and then uh, you know, Lou probably starts organizing his stuff like he's about to get going in about an hour and a half, two hours, because he because there's a natural process with some of these cases that even in the middle of the arbitration we're going to get these resolved. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes sometimes they they don't get resolved <coughs> um, uh, because they sort of have to follow the natural course, and for whatever reason, um, either because we believe that the guy shouldn't be terminated. Or, or um, and the employer thinks they definitely should be terminated, and we just need a final decision. Um, Your Honor. Well, uh, I, I agree with that. Okay. I mean, sometimes arbitration, uh, once the facts are really getting out there and the parties are face to face, can make a huge difference in terms of getting something resolved. And and listen, there's pressure on the there's pressure on the attorneys also. The pressure the, the attorneys don't want losses. He, you don't want a loss, and I don't want a loss. If I can tell my 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 client hey, we're going to lose this, and they're okay with it, then that's, that's a lot easier. If, if, it's, if, it's, if there's an expectation, hey, Myers, you're going to win this, that's a, that's a lot of pressure because you know you can't lose too many of those. Otherwise, they find much, much more talented attorneys than I. Well, uh -huh. and I, I think to that end, 
anybody who tells you that they've won everything, that they've, they've never lost, they haven't done very much. Uh, if you've been doing this for a while, you're going to take your lumps. And it, it's all part of fighting these battles because nobody's ever 100% right. And the truth is usually somewhere in the middle. And, and I'll say this because I think one of the things is how we get progress done, how we get settled on my side of the fence, is depending on the, uh, depending on the ability of the client, um, I'll have clients that say, grieve a lot of stuff, take a lot of stuff to arbitration. Because what ends up happening is the employer, you, send, you get the phone call from the employer on the other side of, what are you guys doing? You're going you're gonna to do this? Yeah, because, because we do believe that, that you're going to grieve a three-week suspension? Yeah. Why? Because we think it should be a one week. And, and, but if you didn't grieve it, it might not go back down. And then so when you have similar conduct, sure enough, that three, what used to be a three week is now a one week. What used to be a termination is a suspension. Um, um, I think on my side of the fence, we do push with certain clients because we expect in a year or two that there will be a lot more cooperation, that we don't feel like the union can just get walked over. Um, 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 and is the discipline reasonable? That goes to what kind of discipline are they handing out? Is it a termination? Um, and, and, or is it a suspension? Uh, or is it a write-up? Um, those kinds of things. Typically, we are arbitrating almost 80% of them probably terminations um, um, on the discipline cases. Almost probably 90% are termination. Um, um, some suspensions. Um, sometimes union contracts say you can't grieve X. You can't grieve um, an employee evaluation. Or it might say you can grieve an employee evaluation, or, or you, can take it, you can take it this far. So, so um, um, you sort of see what the discipline that's being handed out, and is it reasonable? Um, and inevitably, there's conversations uh, with opposing counsel. Opposing counsel always calls me up, and I had this happen Friday. Hey, Dave, I'm sure there's a reasonable number that we can reach. Um, and I said, I'm sure there is a reasonable number we can reach. The difficulty is my expectation of a reasonable number and their expectation of a reasonable number are two different numbers. And guess what? There's probably a reasonable number between our two reasonable numbers that we can reach. Yeah, um, th that emphasizes not only it depends is an important lawyer phrase, but the word reasonable also. Because we say it all the time and it doesn't necessarily mean anything. So Right, right. Know that up front. <laughs> and, and sometimes, you know, with like just cause. Um, as to whether it was just or not. It's, it's as if, it's, it's a lot of times it's as sort of as, as, as um, quicksand-like as is, is it reasonable. Um, um, and different arbitrators rule, rule different ways. Um, um. Why do they use words like reasonable and collective bargaining agreements if they're so subjective? Be because the problem is, is, is the workplace is so subjective. The workplace is, 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 we're not widgets, right? We, 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 you, can't, you can't measure the workplace to such a degree, though, though some public utilities would, you know, when it comes down to productivity, they want to look at productivity. But I think that in most employers, the, you need a reasonableness standard because another standard simply won't work. It, it, it's, it's almost like what's better, the BCS where they throw it into a computer and, 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 and all of a sudden one team is ranked be, behind another. No, everybody, everybody in the world is shaking their head saying, that doesn't make sense. Well, it's because you used a hard and fast rule on something that is subjective to a lot of people. And so, and so in the workforce, um, employers probably would... I, I, I think at the end of the day, employers probably don't even want hard and fast rules. Because what happens is good, long-term employees F up sooner or later. Exactly. And, and I, I think uh, David said it very well. And if um, you, you look at an employer that has good long-term employees, you probably want to be more lenient with the good employees than you do with somebody who's new and a jackass and who wants to try to push the envelope on everything. Uh, and maybe wants to grieve over every single thing and, and test the rules. Um, if you've got somebody who's a long-term performer, you're going to let them screw up a little more. And my, literally with all my clients, I'll wave attorney client. This is my first question when so-and-so has been terminated. How long they've been there? That matters. Right? It's if, 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 and it's, what's weird too is, is like, oh, only nine years. I'm like, only nine years? You know, I've only been practicing 11. Uh, nine years to me is a long time. Um, uh, but at some point, and I think before I used to get blinded by, it's a 20-year employee, you should be able to do whatever he wants. 
uh, uh, um, but sure enough, you know, as I quickly found out, theft is, uh, <laughs> nobody apparently uh, uh, favors theft at the workplace. Question? You, you were saying nine years is a long time because you've only been practicing law for 11. Right. What about a company that has a very high turnover rate? I mean, you've got plenty of 20 and 30, 35, 40 year employees, but the majority of your workforce is 10 years or less. No, no, I, hey, listen. If, if, if it's, if it's a, a, you throw it out the door. You know, if, if, to me, I go, you know, listen, he's a, he's a, he's a, you don't, you don't use that as an argument. Or if I say, well, what's their, what's their, um, um, what's their work history? Oh, uh, he's been here for 25 years, but he gets written up for every six months, okay. right? So then I say, he's a 25-year employee. I don't say he's a 25-year employee with a, an impeccable record, right? So, so if it's a high turnover, they still got just cause. It's just sort of one thing that you throw up and you hope it sticks. If they've been there a long time, you just sort of, you, you, you just sort of try to look the other way. You look to management. Man, management aren't soulless, right? Absolutely not. Right? So, so, uh, uh, so you look and you're like, the guy's been in 25 years. He's making $42 an hour. He's, he's 55 right now, and he's got a kid going to college. What are we going to do? We're going to get into that, reasonableness. How many of you think, by raising your hand, that if you've been working for the company for 30 years, that's a long time? Okay? So you look around, everybody does. How many think if you've been working there five years, that's a long time? Okay, look around. There's four, five or six of seven of you. Okay? See? Lyle, right? Really? You know, a lot of people don't agree with that. Here's again the 25%. If you think five years is a long time and you make that argument to an arbitrator, one out of 20 will buy it. The other ones are gonna say to themselves, you got a problem, advocate. Five years is not a long time, okay? That's what you have to know, that's the 25%. Just like he said, he just found, and he was saying it tongue in cheek, but some people don't say it tongue in cheek. Oh, the guy's been here 20 years, he can do whatever he wants to do. Excuse me? Most unions don't agree with that. You can't do whatever you want to do. And when he was joking, but the joke is the extreme. Oh, you could be fired for theft, right? right? But some people actually believe that. You can't, okay? So we're going to put examples on later today and tomorrow about what's reasonable and not reasonable. There's going to be, a, that's why there's no right or a wrong answer. But there are going to be answers that are generally accepted. That's the 25%. Okay? So we're going to deal with that. Sounds so good. what I want to ask you is, that I asked Adam, I already asked uh, Tom, from your perspective, what are, the most <laughs> what are the most common mistakes that stewards, not lawyers, when they bring their cases to you and you're reviewing their files and stuff, what are the things that you would give them as practical tips for labor or management errors to correct? Just in general, I mean, I don't think yeah. there's... Yeah, you know, generically. I, I, as I think about my clients, sometimes, um, uh, one, information request, get those information requests out there. So if we're going to arbitration, I've got something. You know, give me some bullets um, so I can zing back at them. Um, um, meet with me early. Uh, do Forget you. No, not for Okay, you. okay. What you've seen in the grievance process that, that could have helped them settle the case lower where they made mistakes or they couldn't set, reach settlements. I, and I think one of the things is you, look, look at the contract and make sure you're reading the contract correctly. Um, give it to another grievance and sort of say, hey, this is how I review it. And review it objectively. Sometimes with the attorneys in my office, I say, listen, when we're here, don't try and convince me. I need an actual reading of what the statute says. I'm not, you're, not, I'm not the court, you're not the court of appeals that I'm trying to give some convoluted thing. Look at the contract. Read the contract. Compare it with other provisions of the contract. See if we have a winning argument. Because, it's because if, you, if you don't have a winning argument, don't lose credibility with the other side. Um, 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 but sometimes I find where, where, where they want to pull one sentence out and they don't want to look two paragraphs down and say, well, this, this issue is really addressed right down there. Um, um, so, so that's what I would do. I, I think you've got to be firm. Um, some of my clients think I walk on water. Some of my former, uh, these are former clients. Some of my former clients think I walk on water. Some of my former clients think I'm the worst attorney ever, right? It's not too many of them, but, 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 but the reality is, is you're in, you're, you guys are in the same business that we're in. 
Um, you're going to make calls. Some people are going to think you're great. Some people are going to think you're horrible. That's all right, right? It's a hard job you do for the union stewards. Um, Is no. it a weakness if you withdraw cases and, and you don't think they're any good? No. No, you've got to do it. You're not idiots, right? We, we want you to make a critical decision. We want you to represent the people that, that, you, that you're there to represent. You got to think, and you got to think, you know, you got to think and say, oh, this is a dog. And it's hard. It's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard because a lot of times what they do is they call the attorney and say, tell this guy that we're not going to file the grievance. It's hard. I know it's hard. And I know it's hard for you guys because you guys actually know the guy or the gal. Um, but those are hard decisions to make. Um, um, but, but they're decisions that have to be made. Uh, strategically, financially, if you're a smaller union, you can't take stuff. Tom, on the, on the management side, can you explain a little bit the dynamic between an HR department and line management and how that affects them, similar to the way the union has a problem? Okay. Yeah, every company is different in terms of how they're structured to deal with the grievance type issues that arise. And you've, of course, got the line management dealing more closely with the employees, uh, with the stewards, and, and you have HR at um, a level where they're often in the offices, not necessarily getting out on the floor, uh, knowing uh, exactly what's uh, going on. And if, if a company is really, I, I would say, savvy in dealing with union matters, they might even have uh, an IR department, an industrial relations department, or labor relations, whatever they want to call it, because HR typically doesn't understand unions as well as uh, they like to think they do. Uh, regardless of how it's structured, though, I think you know, management does itself uh, a really good service if HR or IR, whatever you want to call it, is in regular contact with the supervisors if they have meetings, if uh, issues arise, if, uh, the, if the supervisors uh, report back so that things are you know, made aware, uh, you know, or HR is made aware of what's going on. Huh? If they don't know what's going on, it makes it harder for them to really run a cohesive um, workplace with good rules and, and to, I, I think, control things in a consistent way. So I, companies that I've worked with have you know, dealt with these issues in a different, um, I mean, a whole different range of ways, some very well, some not. And some companies, just because the union environment is so different sometimes from the non-union environment, they will have different groups of people working with those managers uh, to just try to get it right. And so sometimes, I didn't hear everything, but I, I know what you're basically talking about. Sometimes for you as stewards, it's important to know who makes the decisions in the companies. Is it the line management people who generally are harder because they want the production, they want the work done? Or is it the HR people who are known as the bleeding heart sometimes. The reason why they're known as the bleeding heart sometimes is because they know the 25%, not the 75%. They know not the gut reaction. We all have a gut reaction, but they know now we have to figure in the A tests of just cause. We know what it's going to take to pass through an arbitrator or to our management council, where the line management, they don't give a shit. They just want the job done. I'm not saying this for everybody, obviously, but that's just a normal type of a thing in a lot of places. The HR people are there to give those that analysis and that advice. That's their profession. Absolutely. It's a bigger picture for them as opposed to just getting the product out. They also, HR also doesn't want to lose, or, or, or labor also doesn't want to lose. Line managers, they might do one discipline case a year, one discipline case every three years, and it all feeds up to HR, so HR is doing 10 a year. Uh, HR is much like the union. They don't want to get too many losses because then, the, then the, 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 the masses start getting frustrated at them. And so there's, there's this, once it starts to get up there, there's this in, in natural sort of push to get things resolved um, because we don't always want to know the answer.